for you to find. I got a couple of scriptures before I get there. You can just write those down. I was in my office on Thursday and uh, finally had a chance to get in the office. And uh, JJ, Tony, and David's little girls in there with me. And, and I was reading out of the book of Genesis. And I hit this place and she said to me, Preach at, Pastor Paul. Paul, preach at. And I thought, well, I'll just think from the mouth of babes, God just spoke to me. So this morning, I want to talk to you about unity. I, I, I entitled this message, You and I Tie. That's unity. Unity is us tying together, connecting together. It's not togetherness. I've seen people go to concerts and there's so many of these football games they go to, and then you see fights at games and stuff. That's not unity. That's togetherness. I've said forever, you can tie two cattails together. You can try this and throw them over a fence. You've got togetherness, but you don't have unity. They fight. Unity is very important to have. Ecclesiastes tells us, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. To understand to wrap one cord around another cord and then a third cord is strength. And in our lives, you know, one of you may get yourself in trouble, might even get beat up. But if you call somebody else, that's two. And then you got three. Now you're real strong. So the scripture talks about tying together and, and being strong together. It's the way families work. It's the way churches work. Jesus said, and listen, my, listen I, I'm a kingdom-minded man. I know what's going on in the Middle East. I see it. My heart is broke for the people there. I do see, uh, I do see some innocence. Somebody said nobody's really innocent. I, I, you don't understand the, the, the culture, the, uh, the religion, and how things work over there. I'm learning it just like you didn't even know where Afghanistan was until 9-11. But, I, but and when I look at it, when I think of the kingdom, the kingdom of God, well, we're, we're going next. Thou will be done on earth as it is in the kingdom. Amen. In heaven. Uh, so when I think of it, I see life through the lens of spiritual and secular. I, I, I see through both. Some people can only see spiritual. Some folk can only see secular. I think you should see both and have a reality there. And that, that this is not my home. You know, we're in a place where a division of light and darkness and light will one day rule. Period. Light always rules. How many understand that? When the light comes, look, I sat in the dark last night. For hours we sat in the dark. There ain't nothing like light. Light's a wonderful thing to have. Amen? Amen. You, know, you, you just got to go without electricity for a little while and you realize that light is a wonderful thing to have. Jesus said in John 18, 36, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now... My kingdom is from another place. So when I think of how the disciples died, how they witnessed, evangelized, went after people, understood the diff that there is a hell and a heaven, you know, all the political things around them, all the meanness, going to jail, things of that nature, it didn't deter them. The shipwrecks of Paul, last week I mentioned to you where Paul mentioned in the book of Philippians, do all things without grumbling and disputing. Remember, this is a man who was beaten, he was a man who was shipwrecked. He was a man bitten by a snake. He was a man who had been uh, in nakedness and peril. He was a man who had been uh, uh, chained up. He was a man that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament epistles in prison. And he said, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Right. And what we, we do? Somebody cuts us off in traffic. You hit a sliced golf ball into the woods, and it was your favorite ball. And you started grumbling. You had a flat. Wah. And you complained. What did you expect on a Chevy? Wah. Do all things without murmuring, disputing. I said the man who'd gone through so much in life. So as I walk through Scripture, I see no time this world will ever be in unity or peace. It's not going to happen. But I do see the church. God's people, amen, God's kingdom on earth being one of peace and unity. The book of Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. Now remember, this is the very beginning. So there's this, this large group of people on the earth, and they speak one language. 
Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They use bricks instead of stone. Does that matter, Pastor? Yes, it does. See, bricks is conformity. Bricks means you look like me today. You showed up in boots, jeans, cowboy belt, a knife, a vest, and a, and a cool shirt, and a, and a purple bandana. So if you did that, you were conforming. You were looking like. I see churches at times that look like preachers. Preacher wear skinny jeans, pointy, goofy-looking shoes, 60-year-old <laughs> and got a spiked hair that's turned blonde. Beard is being painted. And everybody in the congregation at the, at the altar looks like that. I thank God I pastor a church full of stones. Ain't none of y'all look alike. Right. Amen. Ain't none of y'all act alike. Some, some like fishing, some like hunting, some like Astros. Uh, some like, so, so, some like uh, that other team that we're fixing to beat. Come on, Jesus. So I know what you heard. I meant that on purpose. They use brick conformity instead of stone, which is unique, and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. That Tesla dude is building a tower 3,000 feet tall. That's three times the size of the Empire State Building. He wants to have the tallest building in the world. Huh. I don't care as long as I can get internet. <laughs> but I ain't driving one of them cars. I want gasoline. But the Lord came down. Look at here again. <laughs> then they said, let's build this thing. And watch this. That we may make a name for ourselves. You, you see this? It's about me. About my name on the building. And that uh, otherwise we'll be scattered over the face of the whole world. Let's stay together here. We all talk the same. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan will be impossible for them. See, this is the principle of unity. There's nothing wrong with what they were doing. The problem, wait, well, hold on. There was something wrong with what they were doing. God told them to scatter. He wanted them to, he, had to, he created this big earth for them. The earth he created for us. And they wanted to stay in this little bitty place. And he said, no, man, you got to go find England and Ireland. And you got to go find uh, uh, the, 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 the Spain, the, the Mexico. And you got to go, it's a big world. But no, we're going to stay in this little bitty place because they all speak the same language. You see what I'm saying? So God came down and he scattered them. The Lord said, as if one, they speak the same, but they, nothing's impossible. They could build this thing. So come let us go down confuse that language so they will not understand each other so the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth and they stopped building the city that is why it is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world from there the Lord scattered them from all over the face of the earth Josiah come here real quick I want you to quote your favorite scripture right here right here right here I want you to quote your favorite scripture in Spanish go real loud in Spanish in Spanish Okay, do it in Mexican. Uh, Jeremías 29, 11, porque Dios sabe los planes que tiene para ti son planes de bien y no para mal, planes para prosperarte y, y darte un, un buen futuro. What did you just say? Jeremiah 29, 11, for God knows the plans that he has for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope. I know what the scripture says, but I thought you would quote John 3, 16. I thought, no, no you were doing Jeremiah, you were in Old yes, Testament, sir. get out of here. Yes, sir. Uh, So here's the thing. When you hear a different language, if you don't understand it, you, you can't deal with it. You don't know how to handle it. So uh, God went down and he scattered them and said, you're going to speak Spanish, you're going to speak Italian, you're going to speak uh, 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 Japanese, you're going to speak Chinese. And he began to scatter them. And so people began to find people who talk like them. And then they herded up, tribed up, clanned up together. You follow me? Amen. That's why we all speak English, American. We do speak a mix American, ain't it? You go, I've been to England. They didn't understand me. I had to repeat myself several times. 
The flip side of all that is this. God had to scatter, and so the word was used as Babel. Even in the secular world, nonsense is known as Babel. Confusion. We're going to confuse them and separate them. And what happened, then they begin to scatter. You understand what God did here? You know, you think to yourself, how did all these languages start? Well, you know, it's evolution. Man. No, 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 no. God went down and said, you're going to start talking this language. You're going to start talking this language. And, and then he began to separate them. And then they began to find, and then they would have to learn for me to, to, uh, to go to Mexico or anywhere in South America and stay. I would need to learn a language other than Banyos. You'd have to know the language to understand what I just learned. There were two words I learned when I went to Mexico, banos and alto. Alto meant slow down. <laughs> it's supposed to mean stop, but I, I learned it don't mean stop. It means be just, just, if ain't nothing coming, go. Be, is that what it means? Be careful? Okay. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, anything they wanted to do, they could. They were unified, but they were unified against God. Amen. That was the problem. God's desire for the people was to spread out. So why didn't God just go down and destroy the tower? Because that wouldn't have stopped anything. They would have rebuilt it again because they had the same language. Why did he have to give them different tongues? Because they would still have access to the principle of unity. Now listen to your pastor real quick. Adversity doesn't affect unity. Adversity brings us together. Floods bring us together. Troubles in life bring us together. Amen. They actually don't separate us. They could have rebuilt it repeatedly. Unity is the condition of harmony. When you hear music in unity, that's a powerful thing. It don't take much to get something out of kilter, out of tune. Amen. So it's important in unity. That's where uh, music comes in. So unity is power achieved. They built the tower. The Godhead is unity. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. See, the issue with the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, they have unlimited power because they speak the same language. Jesus said, I don't say nothing, I don't do nothing, except it pleases my Father. I speak the same language as my Daddy. The Holy Ghost speaks the same language as the Father and the Son. Amen. They are unified. So here we see the Godhead has this power. Hear me. Democracy, American politics, democracy is set up for division. It's never going to have unity. The Republicans are a mess right now, and the Democrats need Jesus. Amen. Well, some of them. And Republicans do too. I, I mean, I understand both parts, but, but we're split up. So it's always going to have this, this uh, uh, negativeness in our lives. So God leads by headship. You've got to have confidence and trust in him. Believe that he is our leader. So when we understand the Godhead, or if we understand God himself, he leads that way. Unity is not getting headship to agree with you, but getting you to agree with headship. What does the head say? Amen. What does God say about this? Let's agree with him. So when Paul comes along, he gets mad. He gets upset with the Corinthian church. Now, I know a lot of times we don't want people getting upset with us. We like for everybody to get along. Get, so but Paul said, let me tell you something. In, second, in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen, 17, he said, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. He's talking about communion. Communion, common union, coming together, unity, you and I tie. He said, well, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you get together on Sunday as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. In other words, some of you think you're more wealthier than others, more, more healthier than others. And because, because of that, you think God loves you more. So he's throwing that down. So Paul's just throwing the gauntlet here. So he says, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper. You, you're not eating God's Supper. Amen. As for, if, as, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody. Amen. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. What? You're talking about the church. Mm-hmm. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say? In other words, you're putting down people of other economic uh, places in their life. What are you doing here? Shall I praise you for this? Uh-uh. Uh-uh, I mean, certainly not. <laughs> Verse 18, divisions among you. No doubt there has to be differences among you. So, Pastor, what is it that, that would bring forth God's approval? Which of you have God's approval? Listen, division causes sickness. 
It causes sickness in churches and families. Whenever you divide, whenever you're not communicating, whenever you're not on the same language, I've seen families. And I'm not saying that the, the whole family. I'm talking everybody kin to one another, connect to one another. There's division there. We, we've not learned to discern, recognize, understand the body. When we break communion, and I'm not talking about just a little cup and the bread that we take. I'm talking about coming together all the time. Whenever we break communion, instead of making communion with each other, we a curse comes on us. We get sick. The scripture in verse 30 says, what is it? That is why many of you are sick. You're weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep, backslid. You've left God because now you, you've not discerned this body. So, so what, is, what do you say? What are the results of division? First, there are four areas very quickly. E economically. Second, church culture. Third, education. And fourth, race we have division and this is what we see in america in a lot of ways we see it within our churches first economically division division because of status you got financial status lack of compassion produces spiritual barrenness the miracles of jesus they were birthed out of compassion he was moved by compassion compassion is love in action you see a need amen i get a man with no vision he wanted to heal them a man who's lame he wanted to heal him of somebody with lepr leprosy he wanted to heal them. there's something about the compassion jesus had in, in the book of luke chapter 12 verse 48 he said for everyone to whom much is given from him much is required, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So in other words, I, in my heart, I believe that everybody can be a tither. Everybody can give 10%. I believe that. But then there are those who have been given much. God has overwhelmed them. And favor ain't fair. Don't ever get to a place where you think, but economically, he said, now listen, some of you have been forgiven much. Amen. You've been entrusted with much, so more is going to be asked of you. So you don't just sit back and say, well, I, I, I'm not going to do that. Listen, I know what God's blessed me with. So I, because of that, I know that I need to be a blessing to others. I need to release things and let it go. So there, there's a, there has to be churches where people of all economic status can sit with each other without envy and bitterness. And not be concerned about you drove a nicer vehicle than I drove or you got a nicer home. But can I be honest with you? Most people in this church have homes that are nicer than our churches. They're nicer than our churches. But, we, but it's okay because we just need a place to hang out. Amen. We're not looking for an edifice that, makes every, you know, that blows everybody's mind. That's not the point. I just want a house that we can have church in. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. I've had, I'll drive by a barn and say, that'd make a nice church. <laughs> I'd drive by a shut-down car dealership and say, that'd make a nice church. Amen. I'd drive by a field and say, I can have church in that field. Amen. I, that, that doesn't matter to me. But the issue economically is for us to realize it doesn't matter who's. Well, that's why I protect people. I protect a lot of people who in my life who, who have this understanding of giving much. I know who gives. Once a year, I, I know. Somebody that gives. I know every week. I don't, man, I don't know what y'all give. Can you tell, I'll be honest with you. I love you, but you can't buy me. Uh, I was the first guy here. You didn't vote me in. Amen. I'll die and leave for something to happen. Church culture, cultures, division. Where taste and personal preference quickly escalate into immovable doctrines of division. Culture. Every church should closely mirror the composition of the community it serves. Years ago, Bishop Miller told me this, that God be the God of the zip code. Amen. So whatever zip code you in, that should be the God of that zip code. Amen. So when I look at our church, I don't see um, Dallas, Fort Worth. Amen. I don't see New York City. And thank God I don't hear it. <laughs> Amen. I see our culture. I see 77532. Amen. I see, I see Channel View and Dayton and Baytown and Huffman. I see this area we're reaching. Amen. So he's the God of our zip code. And if I've ever got to tell other pastors that, I say, reach your zip code, man. It's your zip, man. That's what's important. Well, that's where God puts you. Let that culture be a part of that. Our culture means the, the set, shared attitudes, values, and goals that characterize the congregation and community. Listen, guys, I tried on a pair of skinny jeans once. My son worked for um, that shoe place. What that funky shoe place? Vans, yeah. And he said, Dad, try these on. And I put them skinny jeans. I went back there and I put them skinny jeans on. 
I'm going to tell you the truth. It didn't make me look skinny at all. <laughs> I look bad. <laughs> Amen. So my culture is this, this cowboy country, hillbilly thing. So I just kind of fell right into it. And though I am from North Alabama, you f if I took you back there where I'm from, you'd feel right at home. Because our cultures are quite the same. Now, uh, language-wise, I might have to interpret but listen, we blue collar and white collar and one church and cowboys and refineries to ranching, love for family, hunting, fishing, boots and blue jeans, guns, trucks, loud vehicles, Astros, baseball. <laughs> Where are we at? Where are we at? Okay. Uh, we, we the little country church. We reflect culture while not demeaning others. I don't want to demean others. I mean, I pick on skinny jeans and funny shoes, but I only do it when I'm there in their churches. <laughs> you know, we talk about California and land the nuts, flakes, and fruits, the granolas. <laughs> I've been places, man, I've preached in churches that merged, you know, where two churches came together. And one church, I mean, I was, I mean, this happened. I mean, I'm preaching a revival in a church where two churches got together. They came together because one, one was dying. The churches were dying. So they got together. And so we stood up. We sung out of a hymnal. Bringing in the chiefs. Bringing in the chiefs. We will come rejoicing. Bringing in the chiefs. And had some guy. And I, I mean, that's all new to me. I wasn't raised in church. So I'm reading. I'm trying to find it. You know where they're at? And uh, they got like four stanzas. And the guy goes, one, two, and four. And I went one, two, and three. <laughs> I didn't know. Kathy, I didn't know. You know, we sing out of hymns. Everybody stood up singing out of hymns. That's fine. I love Amazing Grace. I love Blessed Assurance. I love all them great songs. And then, and then he, he closed the hymnal, sat down. And when he did, half the congregation sat down. The other half stayed up. And they did the overhead and the worship. And I looked at the church, and I realized this church is divided. There's division here. Not, and sure enough, the pastor didn't last, and the church dissolved. Because they had no unity. Nobody wanted to give in. The issue, and I'll get to it here directly, is the word tolerance. Learning how to tolerate one another. Bethany, I love you. I'll tolerate the Rangers if they win. At least it would be a Texas team. But I got to pull for the Strohs. Have to. I mean, I'm saddened over A&M losing, but I got to pull for <laughs> Alabama. It's just it was the way it is. And, you know? I mean, that, and again, it's not about the games and the people we, we got to learn how to like each other through it all can i get an amen yes. amen <laughs> bama lost to texas this year i stomach that <laughs> <laughs> third educational division we got people educated way beyond their intelligence i found out just because and one of the sad things right now i'm seeing among our colleges and universities is a hatred toward well, well, you used to go to college to get an education. You go to college to, to get more intelligence. You go to college to get smarter. But now it's a hotbed of hatred. It's a hotbed of, seg uh, of separation. It's a hotbed of wokeness. It's a hotbed of, of people. Get, it's stupidity gone to seed. And we're paying our, our, our colleges. It, 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 our kids are becoming stupefied. They don't have no intelligence, no wisdom. And they, like, uh, they're saying against Israel, hate them. why do people hate them so much? And I see it's biblical. All through history, thousands and 5,000 years they've been hated. They've been always hated. So, so I look at it, I see educational, and I'm going to say this to you. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. Amen, the Scripture says. You didn't learn anything. Readers are, are, are leaders to so learn to read. So this is not an excuse for fools or the arrogant, but it's, oh, you know, I, and, I, and I, I am the least probably educated pastor you have ever met, honestly. I, I've, God has given me an education that's far above the means that this brain's got. I had to have, have help through college, uh, typing. I'm a, I'm a one-finger typer. Amen. I, I didn't take typing in school. I played football. That's why I limp. Amen. So uh, I should have took typing. We thought all guys that took typing were sissies. We had another word for them. And uh, man, did I mess up on that one. Whisked out a figure dissing out. I, I envy those. I will watch somebody type just to. They're looking straight ahead and they're typing. I go, how are you not messing up? I mean, you see my typing? It's all caps. 
You say, Pastor, you're always shouting in your sermons. No, I'm not. I don't know how to type. So it's easier just to put them all caps. So if you know me, you still love me. Okay, I got to keep going. I got to keep going. I got a few minutes left here. So we're talking about you and I tying together. So the fourth one is the hardest one for the United States. Why is that? Because we are a melting pot. We don't have all Japanese or Chinese or Jews or, 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 or Muslims. We don't have all them here. Amen. We're a melting pot of all of them. And somebody said, well, what am I? You don't DNA yourself. You'll be so disappointed. We got a dog. Rescue dog, my wife paid to have it DNA'd. Oh, no. Leave it alone. I said, that dog is, is, is a, a terrier, what, what, a Jack Russell. Yeah. She's a Jack Russell. Look at her. She's got the looks of the Jack Russell. She, everything about her, I know she's a stray. She's got a little something else in her, but she's Jack Russell. Don't DNA her. Let me believe it. Miss Donna, let me believe it. She DNA'd the dog. It's 40% terrier. And pug. Big eyes. I didn't want to know. I didn't want to know. I'm telling you, don't DNA yourself. You'll come back so sad. You'll need more Jesus than you ever imagined. <laughs> oh, man, this racial division, amen, always brings tension. You don't ask for your pigmentation. You were given it at birth. Amen. amen, it didn't make you special. It just made you who you are. Amen. You weren't born a racist. You made a racist by being around other races. So what has God, you know, it, it was an act of God in your parents. Religious spirits find fertile ground in racist hearts. Religion. It's always about that. I, I, I told somebody other day, I'm not against the Palestinians. I'm against Hamas. I'm against the ISIS. I'm not against the Muslims. I'm, I'm against these guys. I said, that's like you telling me that every white dude you see is Ku Klux Klan. Right. Hello. That's to having that same idea. There are people that come to Texas has such a misnomer about us. They think everybody here carries guns. <laughs> Not everyone. Just most of us. Amen. The smart ones do. <laughs> right, right, right. But the thing is, we're not all, a lady from England came over and she, I read the story about it. She said, I thought everybody over here was shooting each other. She said, this is the greatest place in the world. Listen, if you come parasailing in here with guns, planning on taking us out, you, you, we're going bird hunting, baby. Everybody here got, I mean, I'm serious. That, I'm, I'm not trying to joke. This is why we don't get attacked. People don't understand this. They think take the guns away from us. No. If a civilian's got guns and, in, listen, when that power went off last night, I called that man right there and I said, shut the gates. Because when it gets dark in a place like that, looters pop out. I strapped my 38 on and I just hung out around the house in the dark. I don't want to shoot you, but I will scare you. And I'm not a real good shot in the dark. I got to go, I got to go, I got to go. <laughs> what causes division? You know what causes division? Idolatry. See, we think idolatry. We think idolatry, we always think it's a statue. No, it's love is something more than you love God. It's that simple. We glory in our difference, thereby segregating others too independent. We idolize. So, so I, I'm going to walk you through this real quick again. We idolize our race, so we demonize other races. Hmm. So whatever you choose to idolize, if you idolize one thing, you demonize another. So if we idolize our culture, we demonize other cultures. I'm, I'm cowboy, hillbilly, but, but I don't mean I have to put down city folk. We kid with them. We don't understand them. But, man, they live in brick cities. They live on concrete. And the only grass they know is what they walk their dog in to poop in. I have never cleaned up dog poop in the yard not necessary we live on 110 acres 
If we idolize our nation, we demonize other nations. What is Hamas doing? They idolize their nation, the nation of Islam. And because they idolize their nation, they demonize the Jews. And in their culture, they believe there's death to them, the infidels. So what Hamas is, they're idolaters. That's who they are. So as I walk through it, we, if we idolize our education, we demonize the less educated. If we idolize our gender, we demonize other genders. If we, by the way, there's only two genders. If we idolize our political party, we demonize other political parties. I'm Republican, so all the Democrats are hell bound. I'm Democrats, so all the Republicans, you know, so we flip it. Uh, I'm independent. <laughs> yeah, just because you can't get along with the other two. If we idolize something, then we demonize something else. When we idolize, we are finding our identity in our tribe, our color, our nationality, and then we declare war on their tribe, their color, their nationality. And that's identity idolatry. And that was assuredly some of what was going on here in Paul's letters to the Ephesians. And it's what's behind what we call racism, classism, sexism, and the like. It's what was going on at the Tower of Babel. They're all about themselves and no one else. And God separated them. Amen for a reason. Our identity has to be found in Jesus. Who I I'm a child of God. That's when we sing songs about being a child of God. It means so much to me. Amen. We must take our place as ambassadors of the king from the kingdom, sent to earth for a purpose. You weren't birthed here, you were sent here. Right. You're sent for a purpose. Amen. Find that purpose and watch what God does in your life. So, Pastor, how do we cure division? Very quickly. Tolerance. I know it's a word that, that some don't like. Uh, tolerance is a sympathy or indulgence, indul indulgence for beliefs or practices differing from our or conflicting with one's own. I know I kind of messed that and hacked that up. But tolerance is so important. My sister was had disabilities. She had... Uh, I don't even know what the issues I want to call it. But there were so many disabilities in her life. And some people can't tolerate folk with Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, born with special needs. They just, they like, somehow they think perfection. I'm glad that you were born perfect. I'm glad that your nose is exactly where it needs to be and your eyes and everything. But, but most of us weren't. Most of us were born with some issues, physical issues. I won't talk about your mental. Well, we got issues, age, uh, addictions, things that, they, and there needs to be tolerance in the body of Christ, Amen. that we tolerate one another. I've often said whatever you choose to tolerate will never change. So in my life, personally, there are things I need to not tolerate, so I have to deal with it. Well, it's why I'm always up and down with my weight. I have two sets of clothes. I have the clothes I like, and I have the clothes that, that I have to wear when I just decide to eat too much. <laughs> but getting my weight down is so important because it, you know, it makes you look better. No, it gets weight off my legs because my legs struggle. This is where the disease that's, that I fight with, I, I struggle with. So to get weight off of me helps me. Amen. I don't want to stay locked in to something. You follow me? So tolerance is so important. I've often said, if I, if I, whatever I choose to tolerate will never change. I know that. But it's our personal lives. As for the church world, I choose to tolerate those with higher or lower economy, those whose different culture, or educational, or racial differences. As long as we have one unifying force, what's the one unifying force? Jesus. If I got Jesus, amen, I can tolerate a whole lot of stuff. Amen. I can tolerate nonsense I see. I can tolerate ponytail old men. Because I wish I had a ponytail again. I saw long hair at a wedding I did yesterday, and I looked at it. I think I shocked him when I said, dude, love the hair. <laughs> you know, you know long hair men would not be so out of place if you women would start growing your hair long again. <laughs> Hello. Well, let's talk Bible here. Let's talk culture. You want to talk culture? Women, women in the Jewish culture always had long hair. They had long hair. Hear me. She let her hair down. Uh huh. So when a man had long hair, like down to here, Frank, he didn't look out of place because she had long hair. 
And all of a sudden, I get in the church world, and I hear people say, this man shouldn't have long hair. Ben, take any hair I can get. Don't you do that? See, you see what I'm saying? So it's culturally. We read the Scripture, and we, we put men down for having long hair. Well, the issue is you women. Oh, y'all don't want to hear good preaching today. Y'all don't want to hear none of this. So it's cultural, you hear me? So we got to look at the culture. Some of y'all got real nervous there. Like, I ain't going to heaven. Going to heaven. No, 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 I didn't say that. Listen to me. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, to the Jews, I became a Jew. To the Gentile, I became a Gentile. To the weak, I became weak. I become all things to all men that by all possible means I might say some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share its blessing. Why would you do that, Paul? I'm going to tell you why. This is why. This is why. Out of the message, he says, even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach the wide range of people. Some people think I can only reach this group or that group. Uh-uh. I, if I got to wear a hula skirt, I wear it. I want to reach people. Here he goes. He said, to the religious, non-religious, meticulous, moralist, loose living, immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever, I didn't take on their way of life. Hear me. I didn't take on their way of life, but I was out to reach them. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world. And I tried to experience things from their point of view. Why do I ride a Harley? Because I want to experience things from their point of view. Why was I on horses? I wanted to experience things from their point of view. Why I got a hot rod? Because I want to experience things from their point of view. Those were things that I was good at, that I enjoyed. I, you know, I didn't start hunting, Pastor David, till I literally it was in my 40s. Before then, I, I golfed because I wanted to experience things from their point of view. We would win people to Jesus on the golf course. We connect them with Christ. One of my things I wanted to see happen in my life, I wanted to win somebody to Jesus by the ninth hole and baptize them in, in, the, in a pond on the 18th. It ain't happened yet, but I, I'm believing for that. But I want you to see it again. We try to experience things from their point of view. See, a lot of times we want people to look at it from our point of view. But how can I experience it from your point of view? I hung out with Mike Thies a little bit and watched him cook barbecue. His point of view. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to be a barbecue, but I pick up points. I ask questions. How you do that? How you do that? Why is it when I mess with wire, I get shocked? And you don't. How is it that a squirrel can run on a power line and not die? And I touch it, and I almost met Jesus. Tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in the attempt to lead those I meet into a God saved life. This is our muscle car Sunday. This is the reason we do what we do. This is why we reach out to people. This is why we serve. This is why we take a moment and say, let's do something to connect with people, amen, in such a way that perhaps we can win them to Christ. I, I was with that guy in that deer stand this week, Mark, and I showed him the video of me and my hot rod being chased by Montgomery County Police, amen. And it was such a powerful video. I loved it. And he looked at that and he said, that's crazy. Were them real cops? I said, look at it again. That was Montgomery County chasing me. Was it set up? I'll never tell. <laughs> That's right. Biblical unity can be destroyed by selfishness. It can be created by selflessness. Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the beard, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard. He was the Levite. He was the, he was the worshiper. Down unto, he was Moses' brother, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were fallen of Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Let me break this down real quick. How good and pleasant it is when we live together in unity. Hmm. You and I tied, tied together. It is like precious oil poured. On the head. Oil was always costly, expensive, 
It wasn't like that Wesson oil or Crisco you use. It was oil that was made from different fragrances and, and crushed, amen, and extracted from different places. And when it was brought together, very expensive anointing oil. And when it flowed down on the head of this leader, Aaron, amen, it always flowed down. I will tell you, blessing always flows down. It never flows up. It always, when you are blessed, amen, it begins to flow down and bless other people. When God blesses you, make sure you bless somebody else. So it's flowing down, and it's, a, it's fragrant. You, it's smell. It's just what Mary, the prostitute, and Mary, the, the sister of Martha, those two women put on Jesus. Amen. It was in the room. It can never be put back in the bottle. It had a fragrance to it. Unity smells good to God. Oh, it does something to Him. When we worship together, when our hearts are knit together, when we have a unified force together, we speak the same language together. Amen. Fragrant. It is sins. And this fruitful, heavy dew in the east is vital to the well-being of the crops. It removes dryness. It brings fulfillment. He said, there, 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 running down there. As if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. In other words, the dew brought forth the fruit. See, it ain't always the rain. It's the dew that brings moisture. Amen. Sometimes we don't need a heavy rain. We just need a nice dew to settle on the church. Amen. Close up, Pastor. Okay. Commitment as the church. What do we need to do? Simulate. Quit acting like you the only cotton picking one like you. Get in with us. Connect with us. Well, I don't know you, Pastor, because you ain't tried to get to know me. I want to get to know people in this house. So when we do like the car show or whenever we do a conference, and we have an opportunity to get together. Let's get together. Let's just simulate. Let's, let's ease. You say, well, there's already somebody greeting. There are two doors back there. We need people at both doors. Well, where do I sign up? You don't. You don't. You just do it. You know what? I'm, I'm at the doors at the other church. Folk just show up. Here, I need folk at the doors. Don't we, Lucinda? Greeting at the door. Amen. Who's out there in the parking lot? Who's out there? Why? Well, we don't need no parkers. People know where to park. Yeah, but would it be nice to see a smiling face that you are here by 8 o'clock to help people park? Amen. Amen. Just let them park. Well, I'm, but I'm a woman. Who cares? I don't, well, nobody cares just as long as they don't hit you. Park them. Talk to them. Greet them when they get out of the car. Can I help you carry anything? Do you need any help there? I see you're, you're crying tears because the ranger lives. You need a napkin, <laughs> a tissue. Are you hearing me? Are y'all hearing the preacher? Assimilate. Get involved. Sit, Miss Linda, you need help cooking. You need help serving. Who's going to get down the trash? Assimilate. Serve one another. Oh, if we do this, this church, we'll have to, we will have to take all these pews out, Pastor Joseph. We will have to put, yes, we will, Charlie. I'm going to set you right up here on the front row, too. And we'll put chairs everywhere. You know, this is your church. This is where you belong, and you set, you're going to sit right here. That's right. We'll put you a chair right there. Man, we'll throw us one of the big old LED screens up here. We'll really look good on, fa on Facebook and, and Star Wars or what's that other place? Fa uh, YouTube. It's 9.50. How you here? <laughs> God, why, why do we want the little country church to grow? There are people out there who are far off. They're alienated. They're separated. They're living in hostility, and we want them to meet Jesus. We want them to be a part of a church family, and we want to get to know them. And, you know, we want, we want to stack our life next to their life and love one another. Father, I ask you to take this word and plant it into our hearts. Lord, I know I've gone long, but let, let our hearts feel your beat, Lord, for the unity in the house. Let us understand there can be peace in here. We can assimilate and be a part. That us, we can tie together and make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Servant leaders, real quick.